Hello and welcome. I'm Al Barrows, and this is UFO Disclosure, the podcast that's meant to show an average person's reaction to all the UFO, UAP news from everywhere and anywhere. Today, I have the great honor and pleasure of having Marcus Loth back on as a guest. Marcus Loth is a freelance writer. He's also the editor-in-chief at UFO Insight and UFO Insight In-Depth which also happens to have a podcast. So he has his own podcast as well. He's also the owner of Me Time for the Mind, and he's written a book. He wrote, From Deep Within the Archives of UFO Insight, History's Most Bizarre, Outlandish, and Controversial UFO and Alien Encounters. It's a great resource book in that he shows reports from throughout history, He also includes some very rarely uh, known reports on UFO encounters. Stay tuned. It's going to be an incredible interview with Marcus Loth. Hi, Marcus. Uh, Thanks for being on UFO Disclosure. Um, Last time we spoke and you were on UFO Disclosure was, I think, August 1st, 2023. Yeah, last summer. Yeah, and thank you again for for having me on. Thanks. Uh, It's a pleasure to be doing it. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor to have you on. you're so prolific, and uh, you have so many stories and reports that you've covered that it's an easy interview. Thank you. Thank you. I was talking to you before um, we started the show about the fact that a few of my podcasts recently have been sort of on abductions and why they're happening and whether extraterrestrials are good or bad and whether... It's somewhere in between. Daniel Sheehan, I don't know whether you're aware of Daniel Sheehan, he represented Luis Elizondo, the whistleblower, who came out with the Tic Tac video back in 2017. He's a constitutional lawyer. Uh, He's really pushing for disclosure in Congress now. Mm -hmm. Um, He was recently interviewed, and he said that, um, well, he compared uh, Dr. Greer, Stephen Greer, for example, And Dr. Greer's narrative, for example, is that all um, extraterrestrials are good and they mean us no harm. They're benevolent. Mm -hmm. Whereas Daniel Sheehan went on to say that his client, Luis Elizondo, has represented the ETs as being more of a national threat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, by that, he doesn't necessarily mean that they mean us harm but that they're so far ahead of us technologically that the military in the United States, at least, sees them as a threat because they can't compare to them as far as their war machine, if it ever came to that. Yeah. I mean, I I would say, you know, the truth of the matter is, I mean, we don't know, do we? I mean, the truth of the matter is it'll be somewhere in between. I mean... I suppose if you look at humans, you know, you've got good and bad humans, and you would imagine that's replicated across whatever forms of life, you know, wherever they're coming from. Um, One thing that I was reading not long back was, uh, you know, about the threats uh, or so-called threats of of extraterrestrials. Given that they've at least been coming here for around 70 years, at the very least, and, you know, almost certainly centuries before that, um, we might think if they were a threat or if they were aggressive, then something would have happened by now. Uh, now, that's not to say that they've got our best interests, you know, uh, in mind and at heart. Um, but you would think if, if they were if they were intent on invasion, at least in the sense that we would understand it, then this would have happened decades previously. Um, so you've got to ask yourself, well, what do they want? If we accept the alien abductions are real and they are happening and there's so many cases on record that there's certainly something is going on whether that's aliens physically taking people aboard spaceships or it's something more to do with the mind you know uh, who knows about that and only further study will, will, will get to the truth but if you assume for one moment that aliens are taking human beings aboard spacecraft or to secret uh, dens on the planet um then you have to think there's a reason that you know, there's a reason they're doing it, and it obviously favours them. Um, now, you know, that could be scientific research on their part. For example, we might do the very same thing, and in, indeed we do, uh, when we venture into the Amazon, for example, or, or the icy regions where they're still um, discovering um, forms of life today. So, we, you know, it could be part of a scientific experiment. Uh, you would imagine, though, that, that there is more of a... How do I word this? 
there's more of an urgent agenda to it. The fact that they're taking samples, the fact that a lot of these abductions seem to revolve around, you know, female abductees to do with pregnancy and the reproductive systems and stuff of that nature. One of the darkest theories put forward is that this apparent alien grey race, and I say apparent because some people insist that they're not extraterrestrials, they are indeed a life form, but they're not necessarily coming from another planet, but, you know, we'll veer into that maybe uh, shortly. Um, if they are extraterrestrials, though, they put forward that, although they have exceptionally long lives and they are very advanced, um, the, their bodies are ravaged basically through time and space. Um, I've, I've read certain people have said that they've been told information that their home planet was was uh, decimated and, and, and essentially that they cannot no longer they can no longer reproduce. And at the crux of um, the alien abduction agenda, if you like, is. And this is particularly why many, many females of uh, reproducing or reproductive age are, are seemingly abducted, and they are, they are repeatedly throughout their reproductive uh, life, is that they are kind of using us as some kind of incubator or some way of, of creating a hybridization or a hybrid uh, human alien so they can then reproduce themselves. Um, it's an interesting theory, but it's not, it's, it's not a pleasant one. Um, some very serious minded people have, have put this forward, though. David Jacobs, for one, who you, you, you will be familiar with. Um, John Mack even hinted towards some kind of hybridization. And, and these, these were serious minded people, especially Mack, who had a lot to lose uh, at the time when he was saying this, this stuff. Um, and well, that's, that's often, sort of an. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Marcus. No, no. When you were talking about invasions before, that's a sort of overt. Uh, sort of thing that Hollywood uh, would put yeah. forth, that they would come down and actually physically, take, fact, take over and physically. Yeah. But when you mention hybridization, it's been hinted subtly that that might be a sort of way of invading us as well. Eventually, they hybridize the whole human race to the point that then they can control us, or they have hybrids here that then become our leaders and control us that way, which yeah. is a, a lot smarter and more subtle way of doing it. Um, for all we know, that might be going on now. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, it's, you're exactly right. And again, David Jacobs insinuated, or didn't even insinuate, he put forward exactly that, that the, uh, the agenda was, was to create human-alien hybrids and they would literally be able to walk around among us and, and you, know, you just wouldn't know. Now, the one thing he said, where you would be able to tell the difference is, is simply how they act. According to his research, and he, and he makes a compelling argument in his books for this, you know, it's not just off-the-cuff stuff. He was saying, essentially, that although they look physically human and, and they indeed have uh, more powers, such as telekinesis and telepathy that they can use um, that, that most humans can't, that they can't just fit into human life in, in our society. Now, he was saying that he was speaking to an abductee and indeed investigated her case and it regressed her and, and all of all the things of that nature. And she was abducted to essentially teach these hybrids uh, how to fit into society. And these are really mundane things like, you know, just going to the shop, for example, and, you know, why do you buy what you buy? And silly things like checking eggs that aren't cracked before you buy them. Those right. type of things that would make you stand out if you just didn't do them automatically. And so you're right, yeah, that would be a much more discreet way of doing it. And eventually you would get to the point over the course of many hundreds, thousands of years where there would be no humans left as such. They would literally, all, we would all be human alien hybrids. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing, we can't tell that because we can't see that far into the future. Um, but yeah, it's certainly an interesting suggestion. And not let, me that ask you, let me ask you this, Marcus, hmm. because you're aware of, so much of the history of abductions and you've written a lot of reports my experience has been that you don't hear so much about abductions lately and i'm wondering is it a thing of the past that they don't do anymore if this ever did happen and you have to go back to say what they say that uh, they say that eisenhower signed an agreement mm -hmm. uh, back in the 50s i think it's the GAD, G-E-A-D-E -E agreement, yeah. where he allowed abductions or a certain amount of abductions in exchange for a technology. And then there are those that say that that doesn't go on anymore. Um, the cow mutilations supposedly don't go on anymore. But I'm also aware of the fact that in the Amazon, the Kitu tribe there, 
has been recently harassed by what they call aliens, and they have this myth called the Pelakara, which means face peeler in their language. And uh, they say that these creatures are going around abducting people and peeling their faces. And there has been evidence to that. And um, I found some, you know, because I, I was scrolling through the um, uh, postings, but it's not something that you want to show on a podcast. Um, yeah. And, I mean, uh, just to interrupt, you, you're, you're talking physically peeling the abductees' faces, is, is what you're referring to. Correct. And there are okay. physical um, signs that uh, a young lady was ab abducted recently, just as recent as this past summer. And there was a lot of activity there this past summer. Um, so I'm wondering whether abductions have stopped or this is a whole new thing. Is this a PSYOP? Is it really the military? that is preying on this poor uh, tribe and creating the illusion that the aliens are doing this? Uh, again, I, I seem to answer a lot of questions in a similar in a similar start, but I think it could be a lot of a lot of all of those things. I mean, if you just first of all take the Eisenhower meme, for example. Now, a lot of people, most people, and even some people in UFO circles will just say they'll just they'll dismiss that. You know, it's nonsense, they'll say. However, you know, at the time that that was said to have happened, Eisenhower did go missing, and we were told he went missing for a dental emergency. I mean, a researcher in North of Paul, I believe it's called Paul Blake Smith, he, he wrote a, a really good book about, about Eisenhower's UFO connections, and he spoke in depth about, about this. Uh, and so there's a lot of reasons to think that that could very much have happened. You know, we were told that when that happened, we were in the start of the Cold War, uh, and and the story goes that basically Eisenhower did meet with with uh, these representatives and there were grey aliens and they offered, like you said, technology and they wanted access to, to human beings. The, the 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 other side of that is that if Eisenhower was was not to grant that, that they would have gone straight to the other side, the Soviet Union, and they would have offered the same thing. And you can imagine, you know, rightly or wrongly, Eisenhower was, was not going to let that happen. Um. So yeah, it, it, the possibility of of, of whether that deal was signed, and it's certainly not something we should dismiss. Uh, yeah, because it's interesting to know that only several years after that alleged treaty was signed, reports of greys kind of, you know, started to increase, as did abductions, as we Betty and Barney Hill, and then through on the 60s, and as you got to the 70s and 80s, they increased, like you say. Um, now, just curving around to the accounts from the Amazon and, and the... Uh, and the entities there that, um, you know, were peeling people's faces off. What I instantly thought about when you were telling me that was, and I can't remember where it was, it was a river in Brazil, it was about 1984, somewhere in the mid to late 80s. And a, and a man was discovered, what he thought was a man, and he had his face peeled away. He also had uh, very precise cuts, like you would find in cattle mutilations. And like right, you say, right. you know, the pictures are literally grotesque, but, you know, it, it was a real find. That could have been something to do with, with drug warfare and those sort of horrific injuries. But generally speaking, drug gangs don't precisely surgically cut away parts of the mouth and, and, and things of that nature. Um, so when you're telling me about things like in the Amazon, um, yeah, I mean, we don't even know what's in the Amazon. So anything, you know, we've only actually ventured in so far. So all sorts could be happening there. And Brazil and South America as a, as a whole, uh, have so many UFO sightings and alien sightings. Um, and, and so that doesn't surprise me one bit. Now, just to hold that one second, we'll come back to this in a minute. If we just then say that in modern times, alien abduction encounters or reports of uh, are, are decreased and we don't necessarily hear them anymore, that, that's quite true, uh, I would say. There are still reports, but it's certainly not like in the 70s and 80s where, you know, you had people on the local television station seemingly every week, and undoubtedly some of them will have been, to put it politely, unhinged, but some of them clearly weren't, and something certainly happened to them. So I'll be getting to the end of that deal um, with, uh, you know, that I is now allegedly made. Um, if so, what happens next? Is this why we're seeing a lot of disclosure talk, because in, in anticipation of something? Going back to the Amazon thing, and this is where I'm going to connect it all now, is... Most people who research UFOs and aliens specifically, or alleged aliens, suggest that they've been here for thousands of years. They've been here probably as long, or if not before, we have. Uh, and there's been interaction during that time as well. 
However, when you go back to, say, for example, um, ancient Egyptian times, they weren't speaking of aliens, they were speaking of gods. Um, in biblical times, they were speaking of angels, for example. Um, in medieval times, it was things such as demons and so on and so forth. And, and as we get into our modern areas, area, and particularly when, you know, we were, we were kind of looking to conquer space ourselves, uh, and add, add to that the, the cultural stuff with the sci-fi, um, you know, stories and such, then it kind of becomes alien. So what we maybe have to ask is, are they not actually aliens, or, or as we would understand them, but are they something that uh, an entity or a group of entities or an energy that has been here for thousands of years and manifests in a way that we can understand them? Um, so the aliens that, we, aliens that we see today were the demons in the medieval ages uh, because that's how society then interpreted something in their own minds, and so that's how it appeared. Um, many people from UFO circles and paranormal circles are starting to make connections that UFOs, it's not a case of UFOs being over here and ghosts being over here. and this It's, it's one big ball of paranormal activity, and it's all connected. And so we have to kind of ask, like you said, if alien abductions are decreasing if, if that's indeed true and if that continues to happen then looking at society really uh, is, is a good way of saying well, well what's next you know how do we interpret these things next if indeed they're not physical aliens that, that, that are coming here uh, it's certainly something that intrigues me it's certainly something that i lean towards increasingly that you know um a lot of it, it's not it, It's not in our minds, but it's a product of our minds at the same time. Uh, and I think when we ever get to the bottom of this, and I don't know if we'll ever do this in our lifetimes, but um, I think we'll find that getting to the bottom of the UFO and alien mysteries will tell us more about our own minds and how we perceive things that, than we currently think. Um, so, yeah, ultimately, <laughs> um, I do think it's possible that Eisenhower could have signed a deal. Uh, whether they were aliens he signed a deal with, that's open to debate. Um, it will be interesting to see if alien abduction cases do continue to decrease. Uh, and as I say, um, obviously everybody is watching the disclosure talks and what exactly is going to come out. I mean, it was interesting as well to, you know, regardless of what you think of his, his views and his political views, uh, or indeed of him as a person, Tucker Carlson speaking a few weeks ago about, you know, he'd heard about stuff to do with demonic entities involved in UFOs and it was really dark. And they're things that people have been reading um, in the UFO community for years. Nick Redfern has wrote extensively about declassified documents to say exactly that. Um, so you've got to think that maybe he was told something that was quite accurate. And it does make you wonder where disclosure is going to go and what it's going to entail. And, and you know, is it just a smoke screen? And are we really going to, you know, have some revelations put into the public arena? Um so, yeah, I mean, it, 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 as always, it leaves us with more questions than answers. Um, you know, every time you think you get somewhere with something in this field, 10 more questions spring up. And, you know, it, it keeps it interesting, but it's also frustrating at the same time. Hmm. Have you heard of uh, Patrick Jackson, the Irish ufologist? He has this theory that the orbs or spheres that we're seeing um, lately around the world uh, – Famous cases: the Mosul orb that mm. was taken at a base in Iraq. Uh, Arrow, all the main anomaly resolution office, put that video out, and he thinks that those spheres are a defense system for our planet that has been around for ages. He also talks about uh, those spheres being confused or with ghosts because they're sometimes found in homes or around homes and it's a drone defense system according to him and oftentimes they're being mistaken for phantoms or ghosts i just thought of that when you were um, talking about uh, how the paranormal is inclusive of both ufos as well as um, spirituality or ghosts yeah I mean, I mean, it's just interesting there, if you're, if you're speaking about some kind of ancient, uh, I presume he means like an ancient defense system that's, that that's just goes back thousands of years. Is that what he he's speaking about, the, the orbs? Or? I'm not sure whether he actually is sure that it goes back thousands of years. Right, uh, okay. But he says that it has been around for a while. But the thing that, that I thought of there is is the Tunguska, Tunguska incident, 1908, um, 
you know, where meteorites exploded over over this Tunguska region. Um, obviously, there's a lot of conspiracy surrounding that, and some of this could be disinformation, but a lot of people say that it wasn't a meteorite, it was a spaceship that exploded, and it was either exploded intentionally to avoid a collision, so then you've got to ask, well, you know, you've got aliens there that are thinking of the benefit of the planet, uh, or it was shot down. And what people are saying is there's doldrums in this region, stone doldrums. No one knows what they are. And people who have been close to them have, have become sick, uh, very sick. Uh, and they're pretty much within range of, you know, underneath where this thing exploded uh, over 100 years ago. And as outrageous as it is, some people are saying that they were some kind of ancient defense system, whether for meteorites or other spaceships or whatever. And, and that is what happened on this occasion. And, and that sounds nonsense, but when you really get underneath to into some of the reports at the time, many people spoke about hearing mechanical sounds uh, just before this uh, explosion happened in midair, you know, like rumbling that you could feel under the ground. And so that kind of makes you think, well, you know, is there something to that? But when you're speaking about orbs and, and such and their defense systems, quite possibly. And, and, and let's say that they that was an ancient defense system in the Siberia Tunguska region. We know that militaries and governments, you know, the Third Reich, a great example of this, had a, have an intense interest in ancient relics, supposed ancient technology. Uh, I mean, even following the Second World War, the United States government were, you know, going on some really crazy missions, you know, trying to locate the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, Noah's Ark, etc. So, you know, maybe they did find something, maybe they found some kind of ancient defence system, and then, you know, it's, it's certainly not beyond... Um, reasonable thought is far from proven but that's also the first thing i thought of when you were, you were speaking about orbs and like you say there's lots of sightings of these orbs all over the planet which people do you know assume are ghosts or some kind of alien drone i mean there was a case in miami i think we might have touched on this um when we spoke last time where it was like a home invasion they turned it into these orbs that just appeared in this couple's house in miami florida and you know they likened them to a drone as if they were going from room to room uh, as if they were just surveying the area and then they disappeared into the wall and they were gone. Um, and, uh, you know, they, that wasn't long ago either. I think it was early 2000, something like that. Uh, and, and they felt that it was some kind of extraterrestrial drone there. So, uh, But it's interesting. It could have been anything. And it could have just been something in nature that we don't understand. But they seem to be all over the place. And they do. I'm reminded of the Betts fear which is a famous case in Texas here a few years ago, or decades ago, of this sphere that was found inadvertently after a fire. The mm -hmm. forest was cleared by a house, and uh, the owner of the house brought this sphere into the house, put it on the mantle of the fireplace as an ornament, and uh, before he realized it, it, the thing started to move around, and mm -hmm. it would vibrate, and... Uh, he swore that he had paranormal activity after he brought that sphere into the house. And that's not the only sphere similar to that that's been found. Spheres like that have been found all over the world. A few have been downed in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, so is this leftover technology? I mean, the earth is so old and there have been catastrophic events where entire civilizations have been wiped out. You know, we might just have amnesia and not know that uh, there have been other civilizations around, like Atlantis, for example, that had high technology, could have put up that defense system that Patrick Jackson is talking about, those spheres, and they're just left over. Maybe no one's even um, overseeing them. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's, I think that's a, a very realistic possibility. I, th I think it's almost... You know, mainstream history and mainstream archaeology will say otherwise, but I think it's almost as absolute certainty that civilizations and Atlantis is the one that obviously comes to mind, but civilizations have, have clearly suffered catastrophic events, thousands and thousands, and I mean like 40, 50, 60 thousands and years into the past and beyond that. Um, ancient Egypt, again, is another great example of this, um, where, you know, a lot of there's, there's traces of... of, of um, habitation in that region, ancient Egypt seems to just literally start from the pinnacle and, and then almost deteriorate. You know, there was no natural build, really, uh, that you would see, say, in the modern age, or in our modern age, if you like. Um, and it's almost as if they were the, 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 you know, the survivors of somewhere like Atlantis. But no, I think it's very, very credible um, that civilizations have, have come before us. Um, and like you say, um, 
say for example, if we were to be wiped out tomorrow by a meteorite, alien invasion, deadly disease, whatever it was, that wiped humanity out in this, you know, overnight in terms of in cosmic terms, then you know, um, you might have pockets of survivors, and they might indeed start civilization again. But you know, no technology would work. Even if you had understanding of the technology, you wouldn't be able to make it work. And so as generations then go on, that understanding and, and that advanced wisdom and knowledge will begin to deteriorate. Uh, and essentially, everyone will start again. Now, over the course of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the only thing that will be left is stone. Steel will rust. Everything will be overtaken by vegetation. The only things that will be left standing, ironically, will be things like the pyramids and the stinks. You know, Mount Rushmore will still be there, for example. But only, only stone will survive. So you would imagine in the future that if that was happening, people would think they were the first civilization, and they would have the same. They would look at Mount Rushmore and think, "Well, oh, I wonder who did that." And then you have myths and folklore around all that. So if you keep, if you imagine how it, how we would be or humanity would be in the future if we were to be wiped out then it's not hard to see how that has happened in the past. And when you think of how old the Earth is, it's almost inexplicable to think that life only really began, or civilised life only really began at the end of the last Ice Age. Um, it, it, I, I, just, I personally just don't buy that. I think civilizations go back many, 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 tens and tens of thousands of years, and have probably been wiped out maybe several times. So going back to your point about the spheres uh, and the Bet Sphere and similar ones, yeah, they could definitely be... Um, ancient technology, uh, things that, you know, have been there discreetly uh, for, for eons. And who's to say that the government doesn't know stuff about that? You know, I mean, for all its transparency, there's a lot of secrecy around NASA. Uh, there's also a lot of Masonic connections and secret society connections. And so it makes you think, well, what exactly do they know? If we subscribe to the notion that secret societies do kind of have a lot of ancient knowledge and wisdom at their disposal... And um, they make you wonder, well, what do they know? Why do they want to get to the moon? Uh, why do they want to be in orbit in space? I mean, there's all valid reasons as to why they're there and for experimentation and so on and so forth. But you just never know. And as I say, NASA are a very secretive organisation. And while there's probably valid reasons for that, it, it, it's easy to see why people would, would, would speculate. Um, and perhaps these spheres, you know, they, they could be a defence system. They could be some kind of weaponry. They could even be used to possibly distort, you know, the atmosphere around into open portals or things of that nature, which would allow for space travel uh, and, and things of that nature. So, yeah, they're very interesting. And, and as you say, I mean, it's another example of, of just not really knowing what's come before us. And I think if we can understand that, that'll help us understand a hell of a lot of, in the paranormal world in, in, in our contemporary era. Yeah, and to your point, might be um, leftover technology, but at the same time, it might be active technology mm -hmm. where they could be observing us. For all we know, it could be the military. I did a uh, podcast recently on debunking the spheres, and there's a, um, an engineer on the Professor Holland podcast who came on by the name of Bertrand, and he talked about a gel called aerogel that can be put inside of a container, sort of the sort of uh, vacuum container that you would use for a barbecue, where um, you would put gas inside of it and it's in a vacuum. And he said that that's exactly what they used in that Tic Tac video that came out in 2017. Okay. And that by depressurizing it and repressurizing it, it can move at incredible speeds and that they can control it using a VR set like you would a gaming system. So, I mean, it could be our own military um, as the um, information or the propaganda that uh, has been put out there, or it could be a combination of both our technology and ET technology. I don't mean to be all over the place, but I um, spoke to a Leslie Shaw who wrote a book who they are and what they're up to. And she spoke about catastrophic event that occurred eons ago uh, as a result of the Hiawatha uh, meteor that fell onto Earth and obliterated everyone. And her theory in the book is that um, there was a select few that was able to go underneath the ground into the inner Earth and survived and that they evolved and they are the present day ETs or the flyers of the UFOs that we see now. What do you think of that idea? I thought, again, I mean, I know I'm I, ambushing you with all this. No, but 
No, I think it, I think it's it, you know again it, to many people it sounds outrageous and crazy, but it, it's not to me. It's not that far fetched. I mean, the first thing I think about when you speak about that is legends of the Native Americans. Um, uh, you know, and I forget the, the exact name of the tribe. So forgive me. It will come to me. The Anasazi, I believe, is one of them. But um, and they speak about that. They speak about they speak about the ant people who took these people underground and the ant people, some people say, well, that's another expression of Anunnaki. Uh, and they say that they were taken underground and they survived, you know, the floods, the, the great fires. Uh, and as you say, they were, they were taught wisdom and knowledge. Uh, and then eventually they surfaced and, and they restarted civilization again. Uh, so if we're saying that these people turned into the, or didn't turn into, but are essentially the aliens that we know today, then well, that's interesting on, on a few levels. So if that's the case, then, then we know that they're not coming from space, that they're already here, they're on the ground and they've been here and, 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 and that's why. And, and that is also maybe why there's connections to, to the sea. You know, are there, are there entrances to this underground uh, domain there? Many people say near the poles, there are lots of sightings and entrances to the inner earth. Many, many legends speak of, um, speak of uh, races of people going underground. Now, one of these... Uh, a lot of people like them to is the reptilian race uh, and and they say that you know it, i forget i think it's dale Lussell who in the 19 near the 1980s he kind of did a spe speculative writing and, and, and research into what would happen if if say a, a couple of the dinosaurs a couple of species of the dinosaurs had survived um they would he, he estimated they would they would have essentially evolved into humanoid reptilian entities as we would imagine and it would look similar um, to them, they would be highly intelligent. Uh, how he described them was very similar to how people who believe uh, reptilian entities do exist today, even down to the fact that he said that their voice uh, and speech would be very bird-like. He, he, he predicted or he speculated just based on his research uh, on how we think dinosaurs sounded and how we look at things like birds today and, you know, the connection between birds and dinosaurs. Again, you take these things we have been to solve, but people who claim to have um, been in a company with reptilian entities or interacted with them or, or just witnessed them, many people say that they have a bird-like quality to their voice. And a lot of the times these interactions happen near caves, in mine shafts, basically underground. Um, so when we consider that you know, many people say reptilians are, uh, are very much a part of our reality, uh, and then we look at all the the legends and myths of underground beings and then you factor in that this lady's research that the aliens that we're seeing are you know aliens that kind of live in the inner earth then yeah i think that's quite credible because it would probably make more sense as well that these entities if they've hung on to their their technology from from ancient times or just developed it in the inner earth over eons that they would visit us from the inner earth for whatever reason it might be than conquering the vast distances of space because although we can sit there and say well these aliens will be advanced and so they'll find a way to do it it's still very very hard to travel the vast differences of space you know at distances of space so yeah, it would make more sense that they maybe are perhaps coming from the inner earth um yeah i find it I find it very much an interesting theory, but yeah, not as outrageous as some people would think. I don't know. Exactly, especially considering the fact uh, that you see them so frequently. And like you said, it would be a lot easier for them to just come out of the inner earth than have to go through a wormhole. Yeah, I mean, this is it. I mean, you know, it, it's a possibility. Some people say that stuff exists, but I suppose if, if that is the case, then again, we have to ask, well, is there going to be some kind of disclosure you know, do the government know this second indigenous species are there? I mean, you know, some people, as outrageous as it sounds, say that the we spoke about hybridization and invasion through the back door, basically, is some people say that these reptilian entities uh, have the ability to shapeshift. Now, I know we're getting into crazy territory here, but they say that a lot of these entities have put themselves in positions of power around the earth. Um, you know, and I know, and, and basically that they're kind of, they're almost like overlords over humanity and we don't realise it. Now, that sounds really crazy, but that might also explain why they seem to want to keep their presence hidden. If they're already in charge in these positions and it does them no good whatsoever. And then we go back to the to ancient times and, and the time of the kings and, and when when the time when the gods basically inserted puppet kings to rule for them, so legend and myth says, you could almost argue this is just a continuation of that. Uh, maybe it has never ended. Um, 
it'll be interesting to see what happens. But yeah, I mean, you would think if they've been there for thousands of years, why they would want to keep their existence, um, you know, a secret. I mean, maybe it's humans' warlike tendencies. You know, we are very warlike as a, as a, as a race and we always have been. Um, so maybe they're aware of that and it's just a case that they, you know, see see it being safer for themselves to, to exist in the background. But Do you think they're waiting for us to evolve? Is <laughs> um, I mean, become more peaceful? Um, possibly. I mean, you know, a lot, again, I, 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 when I'm speaking to you, I'm just pulling things in my mind that I've heard people say and that I've read, but some people say, don't they, that, you know, humans will be prevented from conquering the stars by such alien races because they have got such warlike tendencies. Um, maybe if there's an hybridization program, maybe that's part of it, like you say, to, for humans to evolve. Um, and it's a good it's a good example of how things are connected because a lot of your mystics and your spiritualists will say that we're entering a stage of spirit, spirituality as a race right now. Uh, and, and, and that kind of bears out in a way. People are a little bit more open-minded. Uh, people do seem to want more from life than just the rat race. Um, so whether that's part of that, who knows? But when you look at what's going on in the world today and right now, you know, I see there's still people in positions of power who, who want anything but. And, you know, you can only think that the, the fighting that's happening is only going to get worse. And that, that's a real shame because, you know, that's not where we want to be going as a race anyway. So, uh, yeah, possibly they're waiting for that. It, it is interesting, though, as to why they don't. If You would think if they had power, they would exercise it. And the fact that they haven't either means they're ultra peaceful or they're maybe not as powerful as, as we might suspect. Well, you know, I think what makes people suspicious is the fact that they're so clandestine. They're working behind the scenes. I mean, we're talking theoretically here because um, yeah. nothing's been concretely proven yet. But a lot of the reports of UFO encounters and abductions, they usually end in the extraterrestrial speaking on the fact that we need to improve our, our ecosystem, become um, more peaceful, stay away from nuclear weapons. Um, but then you also hear about the other side of the coin where, I don't know whether you're aware of the incident in press club event that occurred in 2023 where a military man, a uh, Marine, I think his name was Herrera, he gave testimony to the fact that he was witness to a very large uh, craft, UFO, that was transporting or abducting people for trafficking purposes as well as drugs. There's also a, an author, I think he's deceased now, Leonard Stringfield, uh, mm -hmm. that wrote a few books on abductions that included mutilations of war victims and body parts being transported. And I'm sure you've heard of Ted Rice. Ted mm -hmm. Rice has given a lot of testimony um, and he said that uh, he's channeled, he's, he's a channeler, he sees these things rem remotely. He's claiming that um, there's a segment of insectoid NHIs that actually consume human beings for food, um, which is why I, that's pretty much when I came across those type of um, reports, I started investigating whether NHIs are all good and uh, here for us, uh, or some are just using us indifferently as a resource, which I think is very pertinent to what's going on now, because that may be the reason why there isn't a disclosure. How would people handle that? That, yeah, you know, there's a mixed bag. Some of them are out there looking out for us, but then there's also bad guys too. You know, they actually eat us for food. How, you know, how would the average human being react to that? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think I think there's a. It's, it's as you say. I mean, what's the guy's name? Paul Hellier. He he went on record, didn't he? And he said that there is at least between I think he said four to twelve different entities visiting the planet, wherever they're coming from. Um. So again, when you look at places like Dulce, the alleged uh, base under the ground there, and and you know, most people who claim to have information about that say that there is indeed a military a military and an alien presence there. Um, and they do indeed attest to, to the fact that there is, you know, 
harrowing experiments involving humans, containers with body parts, and you know, essentially almost like a continuation of the experiments that you had in Unit 731, I think, in Japan in the uh, in the Second World War, and obviously the Third Reich did them, did, um, you know, equally harrowing things um, behind closed doors. So could that be part of it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, possibly the military could be involved. Um, in many researchers, and I think Stringfield was one of these, he said that a lot of the famous alien abduction cases were nothing more than exper- MK Ultra experiments in the field where, you know, they weren't really taken on board a spacecraft, they were taken either in a helicopter or just in a strange room, they were under the influence of drugs, mind-altering drugs and procedures, and, and these were things to essentially test the human mind. Now, people, some people suggest that following on from that, Many things that we perceive as UFO sightings and interactions with aliens are, in fact, government experiments, and they're done for a variety of reasons that we're not sure about. Um, and then if we go back to the un- the apparent civilization that might exist in the inner Earth, as we were speaking about a few minutes ago, I was speaking to a, to a researcher, Steve Mayer, he's a veteran researcher, he's been around for decades, and, you know, he, he really has investigated this, this type of stuff. And he was saying that, yeah, we were essentially we were speaking about what we were what about then about overlords ruling over humans in secret, and and he was saying that blood it's a bit dark but blood ritual and blood sacrifice, which was a big thing in the ancient world, is still happening today. But what and it was happening because these reptilian entities or whatever they are, they they kind of fed off the negative energy of that. It wasn't literally physical blood, but they 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 fed off that and they became stronger because they you know it's all energy. And the point he was saying is, today it's not as if we're dragging people into public squares and, and bloodletting or anything of that nature. But when we look at the wars that are happening today, uh, terrorist atrocities, things of that nature, if we're saying that there's an elite that are orchestrating events, then then that right there is the modern version of blood sacrifice that, uh, that is essentially you know, strengthening these alleged uh, alien overlords, or even if it's an indigenous species to us, but they're still extraterrestrial to us. So, yeah, it could, I keep saying it could be a lot of those things and it could be, um, you know, bits of both. But um, if there is more than one alien or more than one entity or more than one manifestation, whatever you want to call it, and they're at the heart of human events and they have been through history, then those claims of a secret war, a secret battle going on in the background that most people don't know anything about, might have more validity that, than we might think. And then when you're chucking the, the deals um, that Eisenhower was supposed to have made, that could be very much part of that. Uh, I mean, you know, in times of war, for example, countries that are essentially against each other, ideologically at least, will often do deals because it's, it benefits both parties. So so when you consider all these things and all these suggestions, um, and I, don't, I just think it's it's testament to the fact that when we, if we ever get close to, to, you know, discovering what is behind the UFO and alien mysteries, that it'll be very, very layered and and multifaceted. And you know, I, I, I just think I think it'll shine a light in lots of directions that we don't even realise need a light shining on them right now. I agree. It's very complex. I do think though that we're complicit in what's going on. And I think that uh, those that fear aliens being negative, I think we have to remind ourselves that human beings have been probably the worst to each other than anything you can imagine. I saw a cartoon the other day, a caption of two aliens, their typical greys, looking up at Jesus Christ on the cross, and one said to the other, we got to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, who would do that? Nail somebody to a cross. That's about as bad as you can get. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. And as far as eating human beings, we have cannibals. You know, we've eaten yeah. each other. So I don't think that the aliens um, have been accused of doing anything that we haven't done to ourselves already. No, I mean, this is it. I mean, like we, we said at the start of this, how, how you know, we, we, we use that if, if all this was a scientific experiment on the part of aliens. Well, you know, that's exactly what we've done. And as you say, we've not only have we acted in such a manner to, to other species, but to our own, as you say. Um, and, you know, we are very warlike. Um, you, you would think um, 
in the age of advancement and technology that we are in today, you would think that that would, you know, that wouldn't be the case. But um, no, there's, there's very little to differentiate between the warlike tendencies of, of you know, ancient civilizations um, than where we are today. I mean, that, that, that's maybe been a bit too simplistic and unfair, but ultimately it's the case. You know, if, if somebody says, right, you go fight, you know, people will go fight and, and it will happen and, you know, people will die and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it, it does make you think, as you say, because as, as a species, we are, we are really terrible in that sense. I mean, not individuals, but, but as a race, it would, it, it would be interesting to see how we are viewed from, a, from an intelligent um, life form from another planet. But I think I've seen the cartoon you refer to, um, and, and the only rational explanation, it, it would be to say, well, perhaps the, you know, some of these aliens are in positions of power and they are orchestrating that, because if that's not the case, then we have to take a really long, hard look at ourselves as a collective. And uh, I don't think many people would want to do that, to be honest. Now, um, just to touch on one of your articles uh, before we end, we were talking about how humans are involved with the ETs. And you wrote an article, Mind Control, Implants, and the Human Presence During Alien Abductions, dash, What Might They Mean? And this is an article from September the 22nd, 2021. But just to reference that and the fact that so many times abduction victims say they've seen human beings on board working with the um, ETs and I'm thinking one of the biggest cases is Leah Haley here in the United States. And uh, she was a big case. She was abducted. This is a very conservative woman, by the way. Never even thought about UFOs before she started getting abducted. And she realized that she was being abducted. And um, she eventually was in this craft that uh, was shot down uh, by the military, uh, by a directed energy beam. And um, she was reabducted by the military, I guess, to find out uh, what she knew about the aliens, etc. Have you run across a lot of reports like that? Because when I found out about Leah Haley, this was new to me. And that sort of inspired me to go on and research and do a few podcasts on abductions. The fact that human beings are complicit with abductions I know that Stephen Greer says that all abductions are being faked by the military. What's your point of view on that, by the way? Um, I think I think a lot of the abductions could indeed be faked, but I mean, um, I, I think a lot of I, th I think it's no secret. I think there's a lot of disinformation in the, in the UFO field, and I think a lot of that comes from government. And, and you know, we can't rule out that the disclosure that's happening now is is some form of, of disinformation or, or or even information control. Um, now. Yeah, I've, I've read many reports where there are human beings um, discreetly present. I mean, you've got to remember, a lot of these people, when they're abducted, they have hazy memories of this. You might think there's some kind of mental incapacitation that's happened, so, you know, they're hazy anyway. And in a lot, a lot of abduction cases, uh, one of the things, a, a discreet detail, which seems to surface a lot, is, is people remember being given a clear drink, uh, to, to, to drink, basically, a clear liquid to drink, and they... Some recall that they're told to drink this because they will it will help them forget what has happened and so on and so forth. But many people recall seeing, and it's always in a military presence as well. It's not just a human presence. That there's a military presence often in the room with them. Um, so there's two things we can think about this then. So we either think that the military is behind all alien abductions, uh, aliens aren't real, and we are made to perceive them as aliens, and then we need to ask, well, well why would they do that? Now, you know, not just the US military, governments and militaries around the world have got a long history of performing experiments over people without giving them, without permission, without them knowing, and they only would admit it when they're actually found out. Um, you know, I think, well, there's no point in even naming them. There's loads and people that they're aware of that. So that's not completely beyond, you know, the realm of imagination that they would be behind that. What's more likely, I would say, if we accept, going back to the Eisenhower thing, uh, and that deal was a legitimate deal, is that when these abductions are taking place, these military officers are, are there as overseers. not Because they don't show up in every abduction case, just every now and again. Um, a lot of people say that th these grey aliens didn't stick to the original deal. You know, it, was, it, was, it wasn't even renegotiated. They just didn't stick to the deal, basically. And they were taking people they shouldn't have taken. 
So maybe there's an involvement that way. Or maybe we've just got two different kinds of things here. Maybe we've got, you know, a US government working with aliens or pretending they're aliens on one hand, and maybe that's part of this information to cover up actual alien uh, events, uh, alien interactions that are taking place. I mean, you know, it, it's no secret that a good way of, of making the public view something in a negative light is to ridicule it. You know, so if you've got legitimate uh, abductions taking place and people are speaking about these and serious mad investigators are, are starting to maybe, you know, get a little bit closer to the truth, then it might serve them well to perform their own fake abductions so then they can be then set up to be ridiculed and so everything is dragged into that same ridicule. Um, but again, I think it's I think it's complex and, and layered, and I, and I think there'll be I don't think it's I don't think it's that much of a wild thought that the or certain parts of the military or just a dark agency that and I'm gonna say dark I mean like a, a black budget agency uh, are, do have some kind of knowledge and or involvement in these cases. Now, how deep that involvement is, what reasons for that involvement are, that remains unknown. And, and again, I, I kind of suspect that disclosure is a reaction to to People, I don't want to say getting close to the truth because it sounds very x filesy and silly, but, you know, we're in an age of information. Information is shared instantly with the internet. There's more and more people coming out claiming to have leaked information and certainly there are more documents being released. So it kind of makes you think, well, is disclosure a knee-jerk reaction just to try and cover up what's actually been happening um, and that there is an involvement and knowledge of the government of extraterrestrial life here or what we perceive as extraterrestrial life. I mean, going back to speaking with Steve Mayer on this, uh, we, we were talking about, you know, has this entity, this, this energy been here thousands of years and we just perceive it as as aliens today? We were speaking, only, speculation, only speculating, but we were saying, what if the reason the government are keeping all of this secret is because if we believe in it, if we think it's real, if we're told it's real, then our minds are then open to perceive it as real. And all of a sudden, we could be letting an energy into our minds. Um, we could let give this energy access to us. If the population just dismisses this and doesn't think it's real, then it's almost as if the, the, this, these entities can't, can't get to us. And it could be, as, as wild as it is, and it's only speculation, it could be that they're always protecting us from ourselves in that sense. What got us speaking about this was a case of a, of a young lady who had gone missing in the early 70s. And as this was happening, there was poltergeist-like activity going, taking place around the parents' home. They were distraught, and this was happening at the same time. And the mother of the child kept getting visions of, of her daughter being dead, basically. Uh, now the blue, the daughter arrived. She'd run off with a boyfriend. It had all gone wrong, and she'd moved back home, and she was fine. But what investigators started to speculate was, she was seeing these visions because the entity, whatever the entity was that was in her home, um, thought that the daughter was dead because she thought that and he was feeding off her emotions and her feelings. So if we're saying that there's a connection between podcast, ghosts, Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens, and it's all one thing, it's all a different manifestation from the same source, if the government know this and governments around the world know this, then they could very well be protecting us from this source, this energy, this manifestation, having access to us uh, in our own minds. Now, there's no proof whatsoever to anything I've just said. It's all speculation. Um, but it does fit into the fact that these things are connected. Um, you do feel the government knows more than they are letting on. And, yeah, I think you're right. Maybe, maybe people possibly are not ready to, to hear those type of things. I think individuals are. But as a populace around the world, it's easy to see why people might, you know, not panic, but it would make you question your very reality if you're confronted with things like that. Now, who's to say if that's true or if I'm completely wide off the mark on that? But um, I do think with disclosure, I, I, just, I, I do feel that we're not going to get, I don't think it's going to be as people think. I do feel it's, a, it's an exercise of information limitation and whatever the reasons are for that, I don't know, but. So That's disclosure kind of in itself is a sort of disinformation campaign. Possibly not disinformation, although it certainly wouldn't be a surprise. I almost got the impression it, it, it's it's like an inform limiting the flow of your information or taking that information and having it perceived how 
how they want it to be perceived, as opposed to this is what we've got, this is what we know, and just laying it all out on the table. Um, and again, you know, there's many, many valid reasons as to why they just wouldn't or couldn't do that. Um, I would just be surprised. You know, I think I'm not the only one asking this either. Why now? Why now? And you know, people have been calling for this for decades and decades and decades. They make sure wonder why now. Now, whether that's because of the leaked video footage or they're kind of in a position and they have to respond, whether it's calculated, whether it's because of the threat of information that's everywhere and everybody can access. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know, and I've not had any information given to me on this or passed to me on this. But just looking at it back to in the past, I suspect that this is disinformation is probably a bit too far. I suspect it's probably just to control the flow of information, control how that's perceived, and control exactly what gets out. Let me ask you this. Why do you think the UK Parliament is silent on this subject? It's, again, I, I don't know, because we kind of work, yeah, we always have, people talk about the Americans and and, uh, and the UK as being natural allies, and of course they are, culturally we're very similar, they have the language, there's no language barrier, so that's, so yeah, there's loads, loads, many, many reasons as to why we would be natural allies. And uh, you would think we would follow the Americans' lead on this, to be perfectly honest, I mean, you know, People in government, they're aware of this. They, they read the same things everyone else does. They know, and, you know, some people may think that may have more belief than others in, in this sort of stuff. They, they have certainly investigated this in the past. I mean, in the 50s and the 60s, and even as far back as the 40s, they had, uh, they had a, a location in London called Room 801, where they had a, allegedly had a big map of the country uh, on the wall, and there was where these UFO sightings are. They'd put pins on and they investigated everything. Um, and people such as Lord, Lord Mountbatten had a big interest in this. Members of the royal family apparently witnessed these things. And uh, for some reason, they just wrapped all that up. Um, so in short, I don't know why. Now, they'll probably argue there's, 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 no, there's nothing to it. Uh, there's no threat to us. Um, they just haven't got the resources. All of those things, oh, certainly the, the last one might be correct. But as far as they're not a threat and there's nothing to it, well, there's so many reports that you can't just dismiss them all. Um, and if we don't know what they are, and we don't because by definition they're unidentified, then we don't know if they're a threat or not. So I think that I, I would say they should, they should be duty bound to investigate these things. Um, why they don't, I don't know. Now, whether there is more of a close relationship between the Americans and the British government than they think, and you know, maybe the Americans are saying, we don't really want you to investigate this because we can control it better if it's just us. You just don't know. Um, the only reason why I asked is because David Grush claims that the UK has access to crashed uh, UFOs. He said that in the media. Yeah, I mean, there's cases of, of, of downed UFOs, and these go back to the 50s right the way through. I mean, I, there's, there's, there's one from the 1998 and the Howden Moors in Yorkshire where people saw something zipping through the sky, they spoke about a, a mass military presence, American and English, um, big helicopter carriers, and, and, and basically things being moved out of the alleged crash zone on military trucks. And uh, th there's police records of this as well. You know, police literally working overnight on this. The airspace was, was shut off. So, you know, you've got commercial jet lines having to, you know, uh, land in different places. It's also interesting to know, I forget the lady's name. I think it's Kilgallen, Kilgarren. I think it's Kilgallen. Uh, she was a journalist and she was she was murdered. Or she died in suspicious circumstances, should I say. Many people suspect she was murdered. And they suspect that because they said that she was investigating the Kennedy assassination and the Warren Commission and things of that nature. But only several years earlier, she, when she was based in the United Kingdom, she claimed to have met a top uh, military official and he informed her very seriously that the United Kingdom had a downed UFO and it was a top secret facility somewhere in the south of England, possibly uh, at Ludrow Manor, but uh, and that they were looking to reverse engineer it. And the American government were aware of this. And she went back and reported on this. Uh, and as I say, several years later, she, she died in very suspicious circumstances. Uh, and so, so it does make you wonder, um, if we do have downed UFOs, it's on it's no question that the American government will be aware of that. I just think if we, if we, if we accept, say, that these, these things are coming from outer space, then 
we're not going to keep that to ourselves. I mean, even when we go back to the Cold War, there was tentative signs that the USA, the Soviet Union, as it were then, behind closed doors, were, were looking to share information. I mean, Reagan, and you can take whatever Reagan says, a little bit of a pinch of salt so in his late years, granted. But, I mean, he was persistent with this stuff. And he was like, you know, he knows it exists. He'd seen your fellows himself. And he kind of kept hinting that if there was an outside force coming to attack us, then we realised we'd have no enemies on Earth, blah, 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 and we would unite. And, and who knows if that potential arrangement was, was, was organised way back then. Now, it's hard to see how that might happen now with how things are in the world and, you know, can we really get people to forget stuff and just focus on a common threat? But, um, yeah, I think I'm doubting that the UK... There's too many reports say they haven't. There's several reports of crash and downed craft that have been recovered in the United Kingdom. And there's no reason to doubt them. Like, there's no reason to doubt the ones that come from the United States. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have time to talk about recent activity in your area, Yorkshire, maybe one case? Yeah, sure. I mean, no problem. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i from Yorkshire, which is north of England. Um, that, I mean, Yorkshire is a, is, a, is a region. It's separated into four counties, north, east, south, west. Um, but there's, there is, there's loads of UFO sightings from this part of the world, and there has been for decades, really. For example... Several years ago, there were a couple, it was near the coast, uh, in East Yorkshire, near the coast, and they said they could see strange lights uh, over the North Sea, basically. Uh, you know, they, they weren't helicopters, they weren't airplanes, and these lights were coming closer, zipping away, exactly as people described UFOs, you know, zipping here and then zipping back. And they said that as the night progressed, all of a sudden there was a huge military presence, basically, along the beachfront, and nobody was allowed to get anywhere near the beach. And they speculated that either the craft had landed of its own accord or it had come down. Uh, now, the military were asked about this. So, you know, it was reported in local papers and local press. And in this day and age, obviously, once it's on the internet, you know, it's the nationals. They were asked about it and they said that it, there was a military presence. It was just an, a training exercise. But a training exercise on the coast in the middle of the night where people in full view can see what's going on. I mean, you know, they've got land. They can go and do whatever they please and nobody can see what they're doing. And that's purposeful for obvious reasons. So why they would conduct a training exercise in the middle of the night, you know, with lots of noise and flashing lights. So, it's, you know, they wouldn't attract attention, you wouldn't think. So something happened there. Now, whether that was a sighting or whether it was just a... a, a uh, sorry, it was just a sighting or whether something did come down, we don't know. But you don't normally deploy military teams just because of strange lights in the sky. I mean, you might deploy jets, for example. Uh, very recently, I spoke to a lady, a lady named Anne, basically about this time last year, and she said she was driving from Lincolnshire, which is the neighbouring county. She was driving to a small village uh, in, in Thorn, the Cord Thorn, near Doncaster, South Yorkshire, is the town I'm from. And she said, as she was driving, she saw two dull metallic rectangles, basically, and instead of just moving like that they kind of moved in short bursts three or four seconds and it stopped dead move again uh, and stop dead and they did this they were in, in sight for about about 20 seconds as she was driving she couldn't take a picture but she said you know she'll never forget what she saw and some of the details that she offered resonate perfectly with other sightings she said that as well as the surface being metallic but it didn't reflect the sun so it was very dull she said there was like a like a haze or a mist that almost blurred the objects. And what this could be is, again, speculation, this could be some kind of cloaking technology that, that, that maybe wasn't working. I mean, I, I think it was Bob Lazar who said, if you see UFOs, the reason you, you're seeing UFOs is either that's a purposeful decision on the occupant's part, or quite simply, very much as we might be, is the cloaking technology is, is has failed, whether it's a mistake on their part or it's just defective. And so... Yeah, she said she saw that. It went into the, into the distance and, and it just disappeared. But when I spoke to her about that, I, I went online and tried to find other witnesses. And there were at least two people. I didn't want to go on record. But they said they saw something very similar on that same day. I mean, this, this was just a year ago. And, and yeah, I mean, just, I mean, I remember, for example, probably the, probably the case that almost got me hooked before I realised it, it was, again, in Thorn. I, I grew up in Thorn in, in this little village. And... Um, one one evening, half the village saw a huge UFO, apparently, move over the village, disappear over the houses and head into the distance. It was a huge object, uh, glowing light. Uh, one lady saw it from her house and she went outside and it literally just went 
all the way over the top of her and spins to the distance. Another person saw it from the village centre, uh, moving in the same direction, uh, just just moving overhead calmly and just disappearing. Uh, one one lady who she was she was only a teenager at the time. She said she was making her way to the shops from her home. Sorry, coming back from the shops to her home. She was walking down the main road of the village, and she could see it just hovering there. Several seconds, and they just calmly moved away. Now, what I remember of this, I didn't actually see it. I was only about five or six when this happened. I didn't see this. But what I do distinctly remember is people speaking about it the following day. Did you see that UFO? Uh, did you see the spaceship? Things of that nature. And for the first time in my mind, without even realizing at the time, I was starting to contemplate, you know, could spaceships be real, for example? Things of that nature. And I think I've kind of never forgotten that. And the reason I mentioned that is off the back of the sighting of Andrea, I again tried to find people on social media, you know, did you see this? Have you ever seen it? And the amount of people that came forward or contacted me and said, yeah, I remember that. I remember that happening. So it's case, how many other cases basically are there? Did that make the newspapers? At that I think time? it must have done. I can't recall, but it must have done because, as I say, I was only a child, but I remember it was the talking point the following day. Adults were talking about it everywhere. It's in the schoolyard. People were talking about it. I remember my my uh, auntie and uncle, for whatever reason, I can't remember why, but they visited us the following day and they asked my mother, did you see it last night? Did you see the, the UFO? So it probably would have made local papers. Whether it made nationals, I don't know about that. Uh, the only national report I can find is, is a sighting back in the 60s that did make national newspapers. But yeah, the, what, what, like, what those sightings made me realise is, is that there was, and we spoke about this before, there'll be sightings from all over the world that just got unreported or that happened decades ago that people have forgotten about until somebody mentions something. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, ultimately, the UFO, the UFO, uh, UFO sightings, are they real? There's certainly something. Uh, there's certainly not something we can just dismiss and say, oh, people are seeing things that aren't there, or people are crazy, or whatever. They're certainly seeing something. Now, what they are, that's what keeps us all interested, really, I suppose. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about what you're doing recently, uh, promote anything before we go? Yeah, I mean, um, we, you know, I think last time last time we spoke, I think I was in the middle of filming the Mysterium series. So, I mean, that's still available and that'll be hitting other, other platforms as well very shortly. At the moment, I'm doing lots of writing like you always do. There should be a lot more video content on UFO Insight, um, similar to the, the Glock and the Kexberg uh, presentation. But we're looking to put, like, just more mini documentaries on famous sightings, just a lot more video content for people to, to get to grips with and, and, and to enjoy, hopefully. Um, but ultimately, just, just lots of writing, lots of it's always always bubbling away. And it's just, what you know, you tend to find one gets legs of its own and then you, you back that one until it's finished. But... I'll always be I'll always be tuning stuff out one way or another for sure. I really enjoy the fact that you're including a podcast now and your phone insight. That's a really nice addition. Um, again, folks that are out there, there's a great book. It's sort of an encyclopedia of reports throughout history that Marcus has written, a great collection of UFO reports from deep within the archives of UFO Insight. Uh, if you guys want to pick that up, um, it's worth the read. Um, may take you a while to read it, but it's got so many reports in there, and a lot of them I hadn't heard of before I picked up that book. Uh, thank you so much, Marcus, for spending time with me here. I'm sorry we didn't get to a lot of your articles, but it was a fascinating discussion anyway. I hope my audience gets a lot out of it, and I'm sorry I put you on this spot there a few times. There are no real answers to these questions, no. but it's interesting having a dialogue about them. Folks, please continue to search for the truth. And please create or manifest a protective shield over children in war-torn countries like Gaza and the Ukraine. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you for being on my podcast. And thank you all for listening.